Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is the Albert Einstein of Bracketology. He is the captain. He's a genius, baby. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Keith's Irish Stout by the great people at Granite Brewery in fantastic Toronto. Garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. You know, Captain, some misinformed, confused individuals Mm -hmm. will be chugging green beers this weekend, and green beer scares me almost as much as the Leprechaun movie. Yeah, my favorite is when he goes back to the hood. So, Captain, I'm going a different route, and Keith's Irish Stout is the way to go. And this stout is brought to us by... First up, we have Carrie all the way in Phillip, Australia. And big shout out to Michelle in Gilbert, Arizona. And a tip of the cap to our friend Jamie down in Houston, Texas. And a big shout out to Sue in Hanover, Pennsylvania. A long distance cheers to Camilla, a blogger over in Sweden. She says we were the first true crime podcast Mm. that she has ever listened to. (laughs) Not the best, just the the first. We're just the first. (laughs) Anyway, cheers, Camilla. And last but not least, we have Patrick in southeastern Massachusetts. Cheers to you, mate. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's beer run, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. that Andrew was missing on June the 26th last year, we were shocked. We have spent the last seven months putting up posters, searching for him with his friends, with his co-workers, and even complete strangers who cared enough to help find him. Through this, we have come to know Andrew even better. He was well known in his community, he was a hard worker, and he was loved by all. We looked for him in the heat, in the rain, and in the snow. December 9 was the last day that Karen and I searched for him. It was snowing. Yesterday morning, I received a call from Detective Dave Dickinson telling me that they made an arrest. I was in shock. All I remember is saying, oh my God, oh my God. I asked only one question, did they find his body? The answer was no. I would like to thank Andrew's friends and his co-workers for keeping his name in the media and the media for keeping his face in the public eye and the police for all their hard work. I mean, you always have hope that, you know, he's going to be found, you know, alive somewhere because there's medical issues, there's things that can happen. I mean, you, you, that's the hard part when someone's missing is you live with hope and you live with despair. Like you hope that they're going to be found, but you despair that they'll never be. And, you know, at least now there is a conclusion to Andrew's story. Toronto, Canada, late 2010, Mr. Abdul Basar Fiazi is a 42-year-old man born in Afghanistan, and at some point in this man's life, he had immigrated to Canada from Iran. Now, he went by the name of Basar. Now, Basar is a Muslim man, a father and a husband, and his family is Muslim as well. He lived with his wife and two daughters. Basur, back in 2010, worked as an assistant machine operator at a local printing company. He would often tell his family that he was working 12-hour days. Now, unfortunately, Basur was a closeted man. I can't speak to every day, but from the way it sounds most days, 
Basur was not actually working 12 hour days. He would go to work and then he would go to bars or to bathhouses after work. Now, on December 29th, 2010, Basur called home late in the evening and said that he would be home very, very late that night. He had stated that he had worked a long day and he was going to go out with a friend from work after he was done. Basur did not return home that night, nor did he return the next day or the day after. Now, some time went by and his family was seeking answers as to where he could be and why he did not return home. So trying to determine why his family did some snooping and they accessed his computer. Well, they were shocked when they discovered that Basur had been secretly going to bathhouses in the gay village area in Toronto. He had also been on several gay dating websites and apps with names such as Silver Daddies and Bear 411. And he was also going to different gay bars, or at, le- at least gay-friendly bars, right? Yes. And so, you know, a, a relative would later tell news outlets that Basur had hid that he was gay from his family. Um, and then when when his family went to police to report him as a missing person, right? now they told the officers what they had found on Basur's computer and what they had learned about him since he had disappeared. After hearing all of this, officers suggested that Basur had probably just left, running off to start a new life. Right. Basur's family shared this belief. In fact, some sometime after, Basur's wife made it official and divorced him. She was angry with him. She actually thought that um, he had abandoned her and their two young daughters. So police were convinced that he had just decided to up and leave and start another life. And the family was pretty convinced of this as well. So unfortunately we have this man who goes missing, but no one's really looking for Basur. But police have kind of a problem on their hands because there's several men that have been to these bars in this gay village that have gone missing. No, because almost four months earlier in September of 2010, and I, I do have to make an apology <laughs> for okay to all the listeners out there and to uh, everyone. You don't have to apologize anyone, for hosting the show. Anyone in the universe, I'm apologizing to you. But uh, most people that have followed this show for a good amount of time know that this is not the place that you go to to get a uh, pronunciation lesson. lesson. <laughs> you didn't minor. And that no, and actually, I frequently get pronunciation lessons from uh, emailers. Yeah. So, um, but uh, this this case holds a lot of tricky names. So I'm going to give it my best shot. Give it my 100 percent effort here. Well, we're going to need you to give it 110 percent today. So, so here we go. Um, this man, age 40, his name is Skandara Navaratna. Okay. Uh, Okay, Uh, he was reported missing in early September of 2010. He was known to frequent Toronto's gay village, specifically Church Street and Wellesley Street. Now, he was better known to his his friends as Skanda. Okay. And he was last seen at a bar called Zippers. Skanda was a regular there. He liked to go to Zippers and shoot pool. Uh, He went to the bar on Sunday, September 5th, and was last seen leaving in the early morning hours of September 6th with a man on his arm. The 6th was a holiday, so late night partying should be expected. Mm -hmm. Now, the man he left with, well, this is troubling because one thing that we should point out here is that with with any bars, you typically have regulars. Yeah. Okay. And I, I actually, from hearing interviews and reading what witnesses have stated in these different accounts here in this specific case that we're discussing today, it seems like the, these bars that we're talking about had an an even higher number of regulars Yeah, that they would, they would see time and time again. Very few times would you see 
you know, let's call it a stranger walking into one of these bars. Now, the troubling thing here is that Skanda is last seen with a man in the early morning hours of Monday, September 6th, leaving this bar, this Zippers bar. Well, it makes it a little more scary that people are going missing when these bars are filled with regulars. So then you have to start assuming on some level that the people that are going missing are going missing because of a regular. Well, in discussing the man that Skanda was last seen with, the troubling thing, the biggest troubling thing is uh, people could not identify this man. Mm. The The bartender said he didn't know who this man was. And actually the thought amongst those that were interviewed is that the two, Skanda and this unknown man, that they were not in any kind of a relationship, but the two had probably met that night. Right. And then we see something similar with this disappearance that we saw when we spoke about Basur. Skanda was a free-spirited man. He would often take off and go out of town for a night or two very regularly. Right. So there was this assumption here, of course, that that when he didn't show up for a day or two, that this Skanda no had just deal. gone somewhere. You know, right. he went off on one of his his one one of his adventures, let's say. The other thought, too, was some people had wondered if there was a chance that Skanda had fallen in love with someone, maybe even the man that he was last seen with leaving zippers, and maybe the two had run away together. Then about two years after Basur and Skanda go missing, this is now October 14, 2012, Majid Kaihan, who lives in Toronto, he is reported missing. Now, this man is 58 years old at the time that he's reported missing, Kaihan is also a member of Toronto's gay village community. The disappearance of Majid was different in the sense that no one that police spoke with said that he would take off for any reason at all. So, okay, th- this is unsettling, right? Right, the opposite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we have three adult males have gone missing in the course of a about a two-year time frame. Now, let's say Basur didn't take off and decided you know, didn't take off to abandon his family. Now, unfortunately, you know, from the outside looking in, that's what that looks like. You know, when you see that, when you see the, this man has things on his computer, uh, and this whole life that no one seems to have known anything about with his family, that's what it looks like when you are on the outside looking in. Right. But if he didn't take off on his own, then we have three men, all 42 years of age or older. Similar ethnic backgrounds, Mm -hmm. all known to have been frequenting gay bars. So plenty in common here when you look at this from a victimology aspect. Could there be something going on in this area, in this community? So police set up a task force to look into these disappearances. They called the task force Project Houston. Uh, This was set up in 2012. (laughs) Why do they call it that? You know, that's the one thing I've always wondered about with these task force, because Sometimes I find that the name has some kind of relevance. Right. Um, maybe they had something, you know, that would make them come up with the name Project Houston. If I were involved in a task force, I would want the job of naming the task force because mm-hmm. there's always some like interesting name. But so Project Houston, however, set up in 2012. The, the task force only lasted about 18 months. This was closed when investigators on the task force could find no evidence leading them to the whereabouts of these three gentlemen or evidence to suggest that the cases were linked in any way other than the commonalities that we have just pointed out here. It could have been as simple as there was a rumor that one of the guys went to Houston. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why they named it such a weird name for this case. Well, the other thing that I want to point out here, too, and I don't want anybody jumping my back here. I'm I'm the most well-rounded individual you will ever meet. I'm a man of the people. But here's Got one a thing. a lot of round edges. Here's the one thing I want to point out from a law enforcement perspective, okay? When they're looking at a case like this, when you when we're talking to potential victims' families, and we say potential victims' families because we have three different scenarios, one where a man appears that he may have just taken off and left right to a man that was known to leave for short periods of time, but return. And then another man that's the complete opposite that would never leave for any reason at all. Right. 
without okay. telling people. Right. So so we may only have two victims here or one victim here. We we the But we don't know if we have victims yet because we have no bodies. Right. And jumping off the page here, we really only have one person that looks like he is somewhere that he shouldn't be or where he would not be expected to be. Right. So from a law enforcement perspective, even if even if all three of these men were endangered or if they had met with foul play somehow, you have a situation where you have to question it. Is there a possibility of foul play involved in any of the disappearances of these men? And I bring up that thought of a high risk lifestyle because that would be on my mind. If I were law enforcement talking about these cases, if I were involved in task force uh, project Houston, you know, and what I mean by that is it doesn't have anything to do with being a man or a woman or homosexual or heterosexual. But when you have individuals that are reported by friends and family to believe to have uh, having numerous casual encounters mm -hmm. with different people, then that is a bit of a high risk lifestyle. That's exposing yourself to people that your friends don't know, that your family don't know. That, that you may be spending an evening with or some time with. And and the reason why it's high risk, you don't know them either. You don't yeah, you yeah. don't know much about them either. You know, if if I meet you, Captain, in a bar, you we're shooting pool, we're having mm -hmm. a good time, and I've never seen you before. Did did you find me on Silver Daddies? No, I found you in oh. the bar. I, I was shooting a game of pool. I mm -hmm. challenged you to uh, a game of pool and, and what I know about you, if I decide to leave with you or if I decide to invite you somewhere with me, it's getting I, a little, a little uncomfortable here, but you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I only know what you've told me about yourself, which could all be complete lies. Yeah. I think the risk, the risky behavior you're talking about is, you know, it's, you're not going home every night and watching Netflix. I mean, if you're going out to a bar, uh, you know, more than four or five times a week, then you're putting yourself at more of a risk. If you're meeting people at bars and then going back to their house, you're putting yourself at risk. If you're meeting people on websites or dating apps, then you're putting yourself at risk. Um, so, and, and especially now, you know, I have a lot of single friends that are on the uh, Tinder and um, what's the other one? Bumble, uh, these dating apps, and they're going on sometimes two or three dates in a day. I haven't had a date in three years, but <laughs> but they're going on because I'm not going to take the risk. Well, there's danger in everything that we do, Captain, and I, you know, I don't want to ruin anybody's party, but you can tell by the Captain intros. Want to be the first party that you ruin? That I'm super excited about St. Patrick's Day, but you know, people go out and celebrate. You got to be careful. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, one thing that is strange, you know, this this is strange that my brain ticks this way. But, you know, what was it, last weekend or the weekend before was the Arnold Classic comes to Columbus. And, unfortunately, we've had two cases that we've talked about on our show where we've had college-age men or, well, men in their late 20s go missing during the weekend of the Arnold Challenge. Yeah, I think the Arnold is the number two human trafficking event in the world. What's the first one, Super Bowl? Super Bowl, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, me and some of my friends, uh, and we have a, a, a joke, but in all seriousness, we, we are serious about this because we will say, oh, we don't go downtown during the Arnold classic. Well, and it's getting pretty sad because that's becoming an issue in every bar. Well, let's shift gears here for a bit. We just discussed the closing of project Houston, but one of the biggest aspects of this case is something called project prism. So we're going to have to fast forward a bit because in August of 2017, that is when Project Prism is formed to investigate the disappearances of a couple of men. This is amid pressure from the public. Now, while Project Prism is going to be a big aspect of this case, many believe, and rightfully so, that the catalyst for Project Prism, well, was something that was a major change. Yeah. And now we talked about the three men who had gone missing in the two year time frame from 2010 to, to late 2012. But in the time after those disappearances and leading up to 2017, men continued to go missing. These would be men believed to frequent Toronto's gay village. Then on April 20th 
of 2017, a man by the name of Salim Asin. He's 44 years old. He lives in Toronto. He is reported missing. Now, a little background info. Asin came to Canada from Turkey around three years before he went missing. And he went to Canada for a relationship. Some of his friends say that that Asin, he had struggled with addiction, which he was very open about. You know, he didn't hide this uh, addiction problem that he had. Right. But he also was in a relationship that was was often abusive. Yeah, that's sad. Now, in the months leading up to his disappearance, he was doing much better. He was winning his battle over his addiction, and he was staying away from his on and off again boyfriend, the one that is responsible for the often abusive relationship. Asin was last seen on April 14th, 2017. This was close to his apartment building near Bloor Street and Jarvis Street. Police were, they were treating his disappearance as suspicious. Well, yeah, and you would kind of wonder if he's in an abusive relationship. Is that person responsible for him going missing? Yes, major red flag there. Now, in June of 2017, Here's here's what I think is a big thing that changed in these cases. And it might be the victimology. Because where we have a lot of guys who we described, they were described by family and friends or people of the community as men who, quote, are people on the margins of Canadian society mm-hmm. whose disappearances attracted little public attention. Well, now in 2017, in June 28th, There's a man named Andrew Kinsman Mm -hmm. who lives in Toronto. He's reported missing. He was last seen alive on June 26th. Andrew was 49 years old. He was a LGBTQT activist and a former bartender in Toronto who had many, many friends when he went missing. So his friends, well, they took notice that he was gone. And it's reported that Andrew suddenly went missing the day after Toronto's gay pride parade. And as we said, his friends took notice very quickly. And so did the police actually leading into today's story. The the voices that you heard there over top of the captain's always fantastic music. Those two ladies are Andrew's sisters. So while some of the other men's disappearances received little attention, Andrew Kinsman's on the other hand, had search parties and scores of friends looking for him when he went missing. Looking into Andrew's background, uh, he was a superintendent and a long-term volunteer at the Toronto People with AIDS Foundation. Mm -hmm. Friends and family actually figured pretty quickly that the man must have just, they they figured that he was dead shortly after he went missing. Because um, after he went missing, they, they went to his apartment. They, they got gained access somehow into his apartment just two days after he went missing. Finding his cat, finding Andrew's cat, was left alone in his apartment. And Andrew is a person that is described by all that I could find as someone that was extremely responsible. He was a very responsible man. And one thing that he certainly would, would not do is to neglect his job duties as a superintendent or well, neglect his cat. Yeah. So it's because of the disappearances of Salim Asin and Andrew Kinsman that the police decided to start up another investigation and task force. And this time the investigation is called Project Prism, looking into the disappearances of these two men. And both of these disappearances considered by family and police as suspicious in nature. All right. Cheers. Cheers, Captain. So where we left off, we had three guys that went missing from the gay village in Toronto. And so they set up a task force called Project Houston. Mm -hmm. And then they closed that project down. And then they set up a new project because we had another two guys that went missing and they called that project Prism. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we are painting the right picture here for everyone. So most of us probably live in some sort of big city, or even if you're not in the big city, 
you might travel there for shopping or going out for coffee or just hanging out with friends. So figure this, that over the course of about eight years, every time you venture into that big city, when you're going to meet up with some of your friends or whatever, every time you go there, there is a missing flyer taped to a lamppost on the corners at intersections. And then a year later, there's still a missing flyer taped to the lamppost on those corners at the same intersections. Only this time it's a different man's face on the flyer with a different name and a new phone number to call. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you go for coffee, the same thing, but again, a different man, different name. Well, and every time you go to a bar, you kind of hear, Hey, um, this guy was at this bar Mm -hmm. and then he left with somebody and he's never been seen again. Well, that's what people in Toronto were seeing around this time. And you don't have to, you know, you only have to be in the big city a few times and see these different missing flyers to know there's something going on here. You don't even have to be part of the gay community or frequent those bars uh, to know that something is going on and it ain't right. So we talked briefly about the two task force, but there is going to be one major breakthrough. And that will be the difference between that of Project Houston and that of Project Prism. This big breakthrough is one of the cases that we are looking at in Project Prism. And this case is going to produce a potential suspect and even better. This might even suggest that the three cases listed as part of of that project, that there may be more in common with these cases than just men of similar ages right. going to the same places or living similar lifestyles are possibly linked together because yes, one can quickly start to find things in common from the cases in project Houston and then the cases in project prism. But not only may the victimology be similar, but we have one common thread here. And that common thread is a man by the name of Bruce MacArthur. Right. But what is his tie going to be to these gentlemen that went missing? Well, it appears that there is some evidence to suggest that Bruce MacArthur had ties to two of the men on our missing men list. Mm. Okay. So one of those men was Skanda. And then the other is Andrew Kinsman. So friends of Skanda would say that MacArthur employed and had some kind of sexual relationship with Skanda from 1999 until 2008. So the relationship ending about two years before Skanda goes missing. Yeah, that's a long relationship. Later, we would learn that MacArthur's Facebook profile also showed that he was friends with Skanda. Some others were saying that Andrew Kinsman had some type of romantic relationship with MacArthur for an unknown amount of time. Mm -hmm. And again, like we said, they were using dating websites such as Silver... Silver Daddy. Silver Daddies. Silver Daddies. And the other one was... Bear 411. Bear 411. But but I think there was a lot more um, websites or apps being used Mm -hmm. amongst... Because now we're talking about a large group of people. Mm -hmm. You know, where we started off with one missing man, we're, we're now talking about we have a suspect and plus five missing men that we've discussed. There may be more that we've not discussed. So we're starting to talk about a large pool of people. Mm hmm. So who is this Bruce MacArthur guy? So MacArthur grew up in Kawatha Lakes. This is northeast of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he married his wife Janice in the mid-1980s. Janice? Yep. And Mm -hmm. they resided in Oshawa. Now the couple, they have a son and a daughter. And then later, of course, grandchildren. Right. So obviously at some point he's living as a heterosexual male. He gets married. He has kids. They have kids. Now he's a grandfather, but now he is going on dates with men. Well, we haven't quite got there yet. Um, So Bruce MacArthur faced financial difficulties in the mid to late 90s and then eventually declared bankruptcy in 1999. Mm -hmm. And then after being estranged from his wife, MacArthur began socializing with members of Toronto's gay community. And then as of 2018, Bruce MacArthur worked as a self-employed landscape gardener. Yeah, and in 2018, he's going to be living in Thorncliffe Park. Uh, It's central east Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he lived there alone. Now, let's go back to 2001, because in 2001, Bruce MacArthur, well, he was accused of assault. And let's go through this, shall we? Mm Mm-hmm. 
So we do not have the victim's name here. The victim's name is was not shared, nor is it necessary for you know to tell about uh, MacArthur's past. But what was presented and what was heard at the trial is that MacArthur and the victim they knew each other, but they didn't have like a, a personal relationship or. I, w- I wouldn't even say that they were they were friends. According to documents, they knew each other just enough to say a lo- say hello if they saw each other on the street or in a bar. Mm-hmm. Some reports state that the victim was a quote male hustler, uh, which could be true. We can't say for certain, but what does I that mean male hustler. Um, well, we have to, to be clear here, we're going off of a court document that states that this man may have been, the victim may have been a male hustler. Mm-hmm. Now the court document does not go on to define, to define what, what they that. believe a male hustler to be. So I will let everybody else out there use their imagination and you can decide what you think they mean by that. So, and the reason why I say it in that way, captain is because that could be true. It could, it could not be true. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Um, But the story goes something like this. Now, it's Halloween. It's Halloween night. So October 31st, 2001, MacArthur and this man, they go back to the man's house. And the victim allowed MacArthur into his apartment. According to both parties, no sexual encounter took place that day. In fact, the reason for the two men going to the apartment was this. The victim wanted to show MacArthur, his Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. Well, what the man did not know is MacArthur had concealed a lead pipe. And once inside the apartment, when the man had his back turned to Bruce MacArthur, Bruce pulled out the pipe and hit the man multiple times in the head. Now, good for the victim because he was able to uh, quickly defend himself uh, the best that he could. And I don't want to make this sound any less brutal than it truly was. This man was badly and savagely attacked by Bruce. Yeah. For some reason, uh, and we can get into this if you have any thoughts on the matter, Captain, but after the attack, Bruce, the attacker, to be clear, Bruce went Mm. to police headquarters almost immediately afterward, reporting that he had hurt someone. The incident had traumatized the victim. He, he, his injuries required that he go to the hospital and he right. received stitches for his injuries. Okay. So let's go back to this whole idea that they're in his apartment to show a Halloween costume to Bruce. Mm-hmm. Bruce pulls out a lead pipe. We don't think that there was any argument that we know of. And Bruce attacks this man. There was no argument. This was a sneak attack. Right. And then Bruce goes to law enforcement and says, hey, I just attacked somebody. Yeah. All right. Interesting. And so then what does law enforcement do? Well, this thing's going to go to court. And Bruce actually gets a chance to speak to the judge on the matter in which MacArthur said he did not know why he attacked the victim. He he also said that he well, just wanted. Let me, let me tell you why. Why? Because use use a piece of shit. Who does that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I attacked him. How about you start with, why did you have a lead pipe? Yeah. Y- you know? Okay, keep going. Well, that, that's the thing. You don't just happen to have a lead pipe. Right. You, this, ha- you, you brought pre-med- that with you right. to the man's apartment. Anyway, MacArthur told the court that he just wanted to apologize to the court for what had happened, that his life had been kind of a mess in the last year and a half leading up to this, and knowing what's going to happen and what's happened to him uh, was just a mess, he continued. He also said that he would like to apologize to the victim, I stating, I wouldn't know what to say other than I'm sorry for all the pain and anger I have caused him. So the Crown and the defense put forward a joint submission on sentencing in which Bruce MacArthur would spend spend one year under house arrest, followed by a curfew for six months, and then three years probation. Mm, that's just not enough. Well, hang on. MacArthur was also barred from a specific area that included Toronto's gay village, where the Crown indicated that MacArthur could come into contact with male sex workers. The Crown's words, and quote, from my perspective, it's in the best interest to keep him, 
meaning Bruce MacArthur, Mm -hmm. out of the area where he's more likely than not to come into be enticed by male prostitutes. Another condition of MacArthur's sentence included MacArthur being prohibited from taking illicit drugs, specifically mentioned were poppers. And this information was taken from an article in the Star where they go on to mention that poppers are a chemical compound which can be inhaled prior to sex and is a popular drug. Mm. Now, he was also ordered to seek counseling for mental health issues, particularly for anger management. MacArthur was prohibited from having any firearms for at least 10 years. And because assault causing bodily harm is what is called a primary designated offense, the judge was required to make a DNA order. Now, the DNA order allowed uh, bodily substance samples to be taken from the offender. This is Bruce MacArthur, typically Mm -hmm. through a mouth swab to be added to a database. This just seems like a pretty light sentence to me for taking a lead pipe and attacking somebody. And I think because this individual was a sex worker or they assume is a sex worker. Thought to be. Yeah, that... um that the sentence is lighter because of it. Well, okay. So you're exactly right, captain. And, um, the thing here is what I, the way that I think this went down and what, what you see within this sentence to me is a lot of, um, precautionary strategies being taken against this man. Yeah. But you know, what would make the community safer putting this guy behind bars. But I think here's where the problem with that lies with the court system. Okay. So one, you have an offender who turned himself in immediately after the attack. Mm. So the court is going to look at that in a different way than if they would have had to manhunt this guy and track him down and arrest him. And so not only did he turn himself in, but he's also pleading guilty. The problem that you also have here, and this is a suspicion of mine. I can't say this with 100% certainty. Mm -hmm. My guess is that the victim did not care to partake in the court proceedings. Possibly not. Yeah. And well, what I do know about the victim is that the victim never filed an impact statement. So, uh, I'm guessing that the victim probably had very little to do with the actual prosecuting of Bruce MacArthur. Right. So So you, you, the victim is not shouting, throw him in jail. Then, well, here's the thing. You, you have two things going on. You have a, you have a, trial where you have the offender who's saying, look, I did this. I'm guilty. And I turned myself in. And Mm -hmm. then you have the, what we would call the state's case here in the, in the United States, the state's case would be, we don't have a victim to present to you to say, this is what happened. Right. So that's why I think the, the sentence seems a little light. However, what I wonder about and, and what I kind of applaud the judge in the court system here for doing is that I see a lot of precautionary attempts here at, at, Hey, we believe this guy could be pretty violent. We don't understand what went down. We don't have a victim to speak with. He doesn't really understand it. Right. Or at least what he's claiming is he doesn't understand why he attacked. Maybe we just need to make sure that a, his DNA is in the system Mm -hmm. because that's a huge deterrent. And I don't care what anybody says out there. I will argue that until the, what is it till the cows come home? Where <laughs> yeah. were the cows? Yeah. But anyway, I will argue that till the cows come home and then B, this man can't hold any firearms for at least 10 years. We want him to go to anger management classes. So there's a lot of precautionary things going on here. Mm-hmm. Also, we don't want him to be in an area or around people that we identify that would fall into play with his victim. You know, that, that line up with his victim. Yeah, that's the scary thing about this, though. Hey, we want you to stay out of this area. I mean, to me, that's basically stating to the community that this guy is um, is a potential threat down the line. Yeah, he's either somebody that just needs a little bit of help or is a threatening individual. Now that we know a little bit more about Bruce MacArthur, let's fill in some of our timeline here. Mm-hmm. So it was late June 2017 when Andrew Kinsman was last seen and then reported missing. It was August of that same year when Project Prism was formed. Now, in September of 2017, this is this is interesting here. This is when police identify Bruce MacArthur, whom we just discussed, as a person of possible interest in the connection 
uh, with Andrew Kinsman's di- disappearance. Right. Now, this is not announced at this time to the public. This is simply just a part of their investigation. Then in October of 2017, police begin to follow Bruce MacArthur. That's right. He is put under surveillance. Good. He's being followed. And I don't have the details of such, but this is what we've seen. We've seen this type of activity from police. It's almost certainly around the clock surveillance. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what does that mean? That means they think this dude is up to something terrible. And if we follow him long enough, we might be able to catch him in the act or catch him in the act of breaking some kind of law so we can lock him up. Right. But we have these individuals in this community that Bruce has been a part of. um, And he had a vicious attack against somebody from this community. And now, I mean, you know, your thoughts have to be on some level when you're looking for these uh, missing men that when you come across, um, Bruce MacArthur, and then you figure out what he did, what the crime he did to be in the system, mm-hmm. you start, you, this would be kind of a light bulb moment, right? This could be oh, our course. guy. Of course. Well, in December, this is December 5th of 2017, police warned members of Toronto's gay community to be um, weary of dating apps, to stay away from dating apps. And then three days later, on the 8th of December, This is a bit of a strange move, and we'll get into this more later. But the police say that there is no reason to believe that the disappearances in the two different task force cases are related, meaning the disappearance in relation to um, Project Houston, which was three missing men, and then the two missing persons cases in Project Prism. They're announcing to the public that there is no reason for anyone to believe that these disappearances are connected to one another. Hmm. That's interesting. But they're saying don't use these dating apps. You know that there's some guy out there, right? He's on, uh, what is it, Silver Daddies? Mm-hmm. And he, he gets no likes on his photos, right? Everybody's swiping him <laughs> left, right? And he gets a date, and he's excited with a handsome gentleman. And they're supposed to go to the gay village on Friday night. But on Thursday night, he turns on his radio. Right. He turns on the radio (laughs) Thursday night, and the police are like, hey, knock it off with these dating apps. Don't use them. We got people going missing, and we think they're connected with possibly dating websites or a dating app. What do you do? Do you go on the date? Or do you risk it? No. Here's what you do. I'll tell you what you do. Okay. Okay. You postpone the date for at least a week, maybe a week and a half. And during the meantime, you stalk this gentleman online. (laughs) Find out everything you can about him. Bring some pepper spray. Now, in all seriousness, um, me, I'm a gut feeling guy. and, And throughout my life, I've gotten some gut feelings that just tell me not to do something for no reason at all. Right. I follow that gut. I don't do it. Now, anybody that chooses to use dating apps or, you know, more power to you. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a lot of good people meeting other good people that way. Tell somebody where you're going, bring a friend along for the first encounter. There are many different things that you can do. Go to a place where you know a lot of other people, you know, Hey, you want, you want to go here and hang out where I know other people. Uh, My friends will text me and say, uh, I think it happened Saturday. Hey, I'm going to meet this guy at whatever time. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) I'm a horrible person because I start making Zero killer jokes. Oh, there you go. That that always yeah. makes everybody feel happy. So anyway, in December, we have the police warning people not to use these dating apps. We also have p- the police saying that the disappearances between the two projects, while they might be connected within each other, they're not connected to the other. And then this happened. This morning at approximately 10.25 a.m., police arrested 66-year-old Bruce MacArthur of the City of Toronto. He is self-employed as a landscaper using the company name Artistic Design, and he lives in the Thorncliffe Park area. He has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder in relation to Mr. Kinsman and Mr. Essen. We believe he is responsible for the deaths of Mr. Essen and Mr. Kinsman, 
and we be believe he is responsible for the deaths of other men who have yet to be identified. In other words, we believe there are other victims. As of right now, interviews are taking place and police have secured five properties, four in Toronto and one in Madoc, connected to Bruce MacArthur in an effort to further investigate these occurrences. We have not yet found the bodies. Uh, we're actively looking for them. Uh, we're conducting these search warrants in efforts to locate the bodies, but at this point in time, no, we have not located them. I'm well aware of the difficulty of prosecuting people without recovering the bodies, but in this case, we believe we have strong enough evidence where we can do exactly that. All right, so now we're saying, or law enforcement is saying, we think at least these two, um, the two victims that are connected with Project Prism, mm -hmm. are connected. So the way that this is being reported at this time is that on January 17th, 2018, investigators searched several properties all linked to Bruce MacArthur, including his residence and a property where he was known to store supplies. Mm-hmm. Evidence at either one or both of these locations is found that seems to be good enough to tie Bruce MacArthur uh, to the deaths of Kinsman and Asin. Now, at this time, at the time of the arrest, as you heard on January 18th, 2018, they have no bodies yet. Uh, but regardless, MacArthur is arrested and charged with two counts of first degree murder. Now, a little more clarity on the subject, because one question that I find presented often, it seems uh, this to be a big one, is how and when did this guy get on the police's radar, right? Right. Because here we have them saying he's linked to two cases via the charges we just discussed, but there is certainly a much longer relationship between Bruce and a man that disappeared. Bruce employed Skanda. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a romantic relationship. So when and why did Bruce appear on the police's radar? Now, Toronto police have not said exactly how long Bruce MacArthur had been on their radar. They have said that the charges were laid out after months of probing. Now, according to information told to the local media by employees at a place called Dom's Auto Parts Shop, well, a source says investigators had been on to Bruce MacArthur since at least the fall of 2017. In fact, the owner of the shop said police officers arrived in late September. This was because they there were suspicious about a vehicle. Um, they asked for and began watching surveillance video of Bruce MacArthur selling his Dodge Caravan to the shop. Mm -hmm. After studying the tape, the police then seized the old rusted maroon Dodge caravan sold by MacArthur and they had it towed away. There's always a creeper van. Now my guess is there must've been something in that van because then they start, that's when they start to follow Bruce MacArthur around and then listen to this new story and listen close because okay. there's a lot in there. I'm Adrian Gobriel. We're live outside of alleged serial killer Bruce MacArthur's apartment tonight in East Toronto. Now, the, tonight a police source confirms with us that back on January 18th, they watched a young man walk into the 19th floor of MacArthur's apartment. That is when officers moved in, rushing the apartment, kicking down the door inside. They found that young man handcuffed to the alleged serial killer's bed. Now, our police source says that young man made it out safe, though tonight we're learning more about another man whose fate is still unclear. He was just a lovely person, and he's going to be missed. Investigators believe 47-year-old Dean Lissowick was killed sometime between May 2016 and July 2017. No one ever reported him missing. However, Lissowick was a regular at the Scott Mission in Toronto for more than a decade. Staff tell me the last time he was there was in April of 2016. I spoke with a longtime worker at the mission today who knew Lissowick and shared her colleagues' memories of him, a memory of a man they say is important to share. 
he would often give to clients out of his own. So if he realized that somebody needed shelter, he would put it upon himself, that person needs it more than me, and he would give up his bed. And very generous out of just whatever he had, whether it was change or an item of clothing, he would often be known just to pass that on to other clients or residents. MacArthur is charged with the murder of five men, Andrew Kinsman, Salim Essen, Majid Kahan, Saroosh Mashmoudi, and Dean Lisowick. Yesterday, we told you that police have unearthed the dismembered remains of at least three unidentified individuals from multiple large planters from some of the 30 properties they're sifting through. On January 21st, City News captured police removing this large, heavy planter from the property of Ron Smith and Karen Frazier. Today, I spoke on the phone with Smith. He says police have been very professional while conducting their investigation on the couple's lee side property, and his heart goes out to the victims and their families. Though being removed from their homes with no return date in sight has been difficult. What an upheaval. You have to get out of your house. You have to get out now. This is serious, and bye-bye. So we grabbed a couple of things, left, and it's been a shambles ever since. It's an alternate reality. You're waking up. We've, we're now on our second group of, of friends who have been good enough to be able to keep us. Um, we aren't that far away, so what we do is every now and then we drive by just to check in to see what it looks like. And it really is it's very surreal. Now Smith adds that MacArthur worked on his property for about 10 years. He'd do some free work there. In turn, they let MacArthur store some of his equipment on their lee side property in the garage at their home. Now, tonight, uh, the folks over at Scott Mission also confirmed with me that police came and interviewed them just before we went in there today. They were asking if anyone else who uses the mission may have ties to Bruce MacArthur. Tonight, the investigation still continues. It's a story we'll be keeping a close eye on in the days to come. So just to be clear what they stated, that they were following Bruce, they were sur running surveillance on him. Mm. Uh, a male goes into his apartment. They decide to go into the apartment, make arrest. I think they were worried what would happen to this individual. When they get in there, this individual is handcuffed. Yes, and that's a whole nother big ball of yarn that we're going to have to unravel on tomorrow's show. Much more to get to in this case. We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll see you in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.